So did you guys have any remaining questions about mission eight, which is which is due today? Not really. No? All right. Would you like it to be due tomorrow? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, all right, well, um, it's mostly definite integrals, and um, I mean, there's some mu substitution, but not too much, really. Um, I'll work one of the problems in there, which is a little bit tricky for you guys, before I go on to do more area problems. So, because um, I, I think this one, it, it kind of catches you off guard if you're not ready for it, but something like... Um, the integral of x plus 1 over x. Um, well, actually, x plus 1 over x is, well, I'll do this one. This one's actually not, this one's actually easy. And um, you're supposed to do from minus 3 to minus 1, I think, is the bounds. And um, so this one, which is, uh, by the way, I'm working problem 116 for you guys. Uh, okay, so algebra to start with, minus 3 to minus 1, and we get x over x plus 1 over x. Because the addition is in the numerator, I can do that. And then, of course, that is the integral from minus 3 to minus 1 of 1 plus 1 over x dx. And then I integrate. So that's x plus the natural log of the absolute value of x. And then FTC2 says evaluate that from minus 3 to minus 1, right? And um, OK, so I've got uh, minus 1 plus the natural log of the absolute value of minus 1, minus parentheses, minus 3, plus the natural log of the absolute value of minus 3. Now, the natural log of 1 is 0. So this piece right here just works out to 0. And we get 3 minus 1, which is 2. So we get 2 plus the natural log of 3 as our answer here because the absolute value of minus 3 is just 3 again, right? So this one's not too bad, is it? I mean, it, it looks kind of, it looks a little scary to start. Here's how to make it a little bit harder. And I think this kind of problem might be appear in like mission 9. But if I do, instead of having the uh, x downstairs, if I have, if I have the x upstairs and the x plus 1 downstairs, then it becomes a little bit trickier. All right, I'll just do the indefinite integral for this one. Okay, if we can do the indefinite integral, you can figure out how to do the definite integral, right? The one with the numbers. So what's the trouble here? I can't just I can't I can't just break up addition like we can't break up addition in the denominator, right? So what do we do? Well, well, that'll make the situation worse. Then I'll have, you know, x squared upstairs and x squared downstairs. And How about this? To the power of the denominator. What, now, what are you saying? Put, you want to let u equal the denominator? Uh, see, yeah, see, that's not true, though. x over x plus 1 is not equal to x over x plus x over 1. This, this is, this is not, not true. We cannot break up addition in the denominator. So, yeah, we're stuck here. We can't do that. We can't do the algebra that we did in the past problem with this one. It looks very similar, but it's actually very different. So one way you could do it is, yeah, make u a substitution and see where it takes you, but it's a little bit different here. So if u is equal to x plus 1, right? So du is dx, right? And so when you make the substitution, you've got x du over u. 
okay, so then what? You can't just leave the x, right? We didn't have this happen in previous examples, right? Like we never had an x just sitting there. What do you do with it? Well, it depends on your substitution. If your substitution is not a, it can happen that when you have an x like that, there's no remedy. There's no fix for it, and your substitution was wrong. This case, though, we can solve for x. You see this? If u is equal to x plus 1, what's x equal to? u minus 1, right? So we can trade the x for a u minus 1. And then we're in business, see, because then it's like the last problem. So we have u over u, minus 1 over u, du, right? Which is the integral of 1 minus 1 over u, du, which is, of course, u minus the natural log of the absolute value of u plus a constant, which finally gives us x plus 1 minus the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1 plus a constant. So it turns out that u substitution is one viable path. There's a way to do this without u substitution, though, I should mention. Um, like another way to do this problem. I'll let you guys catch up with your writing before I show you that. But So So if you had something like x squared over x squared plus 1, I may have done this before, but um, do it again here. So the issue is, another way you could have seen this last one is to have done the long division. See, this is like x, and we're dividing x plus 1 into it. So how many times do you get, you get, you get 1, you put 1 here. That puts x plus 1 down here, you subtract, you get minus 1. So that shows you that x over x plus 1 is equal to 1 minus 1 over x plus 1. So this algebra would have also led you to the same kind of like integral. So this, 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 this next one here, I'll do the algebra, you know. Um, if I divide x squared plus 1 into x squared, see, the thing is, x squared over um, x squared over x squared plus 1 is an improper fraction in terms of like rational functions, right? Because the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator are equal. So whenever that's the case, you can do long division to peel off like a a polynomial part and leave you with what's called a proper fraction. A proper fraction is one where the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So here, um, and let me make this more exciting. It could have been like x cubed, all right? If I had an x cubed there, I would do this. I say, okay, I've got x cubed. I'm trying to divide x squared plus 1 into it. So what do I, I put an x, right? And that gives me x cubed plus x. I have to subtract that, which gives me minus minus x. So at this point, that's the remainder. Because the degree of minus x is 1, the degree of the divisor here is 2. Like x squared plus 1 has degree 2. Once you have a term, once your remainder what's ever left over after you subtract off pieces. When that has a degree smaller than your divisor, you're done. And so what this shows is that x cubed over x squared plus 1, that's actually equal to x minus x over x squared plus 1. So you see this integral is actually the integral of x minus x over x squared plus 1. And then, like, of course, the x we can just straight up integrate, right? What is that?
you know, one half x squared, right? Minus the integral of x dx over x squared plus one. I suggest we make a u equal x squared plus one substitution. So du is two x dx So that gives us x dx is what? x dx is 1 half du. So we have 1 half the integral of du over u. So the, the way to deal with these kind of problems is really a mixture of wise u substitutions and also polynomial long division. Right, which we know from pre-calculus, or we've forgotten from pre-calculus, or it was never taught to us in pre-calculus because perhaps you were just taught synthetic division. Synthetic division is no help to you if you have to divide by x squared plus 1, unless you know the souped-up synthetic division, which only people know about when there's an internet argument. Let's see here, so minus 1 half. Natural log absolute value of u plus a constant. And so final answer, 1 half x squared minus 1 half natural log of x squared plus 1 plus a constant. Do you understand why I could drop the absolute value on my answer? It's because x squared plus 1 is never negative, right? So I can, if I have an absolute value of something that's always positive, I don't need to put absolute value anymore, right? I don't want to. It's logically equivalent to just drop absolute value bars. If the thing you're taking the absolute value of is just always positive, like x squared plus 1 is always greater than or equal to 1, so it's certainly positive. So anyway, a couple of token examples. I think most of Mission 8 is easier than what I'm doing right now. Like mission, That's the Mission 8 problem. Right, this, if this is the mission eight problem. This is not, this is like mission nine, okay? Which you should probably start working on, you know? That's why I was making mission eight due today. So you'd be working on mission nine going forward. So if you're not doing that, then, well, anyway, at some point we'll have a test. Um, at some point pretty soon, right? So uh, the, the, the topic we were to that I need to give you more examples of is calculating areas bounded by curves, right? And um, so I thought I would look in this handy dandy calculus book and find us some more problems to look at, you know? Um, so let's see here. Well, did I manage to pick the one calculus book on earth that doesn't have these problems? <laughs> it's, it's got problems about calculating volumes, but I, I don't want to make you guys calculate volumes. I'm leaving that for calculus too, because I don't think we teach that in Calc 1 here. So I don't want to be, you know, putting that on you when we don't do that in here. Uh huh. Area of bounded regions in the plane, page 987 to 989. I got two pages. I hope that I hope there's enough to keep us interested here. Hmm. Well, maybe rats. No. All right. So this. Well, we can try. Let's see here. I mean, I can just make up problems, but the thing is, when I do that, they tend to have ugly answers. You know, you know? So, if I try to 
pick something out of a book, which tends to have pretty answers. Let's see here. So um, here we're supposed to find the area bounded by. Find area bounded by. Here we go. Um, the parabola. Um, x equals to minus y squared. And the line y equals to x plus 2. This is pretty similar to the example we worked last time. But it's good. We can do it again. Okay, so the first order of business is to graph what you're, what you're, you know, get a handle on it and try to graph what you're looking at here. Um, so y, x equals minus y squared is, is this thing. It's a parabola which opens sideways in the negative x direction, all right? And um, y equals x plus 2. Well, that's got a y-intercept of 2 and a slope of 1. So that looks something like this, right? So we need to find these points of intersection, right? Because we're going to try to find the area of this shape here, right? So what do you guys think? Should we slice this horizontally or should we slice this vertically? What's the right tack to take? See, I, you know, if you look at this, I think you can see that the right x is minus y squared, right? And the left x is um, y minus 2, right? And so if you, if you draw a horizontal rectangle, that's the way to go because you've always got a clearly defined right function and left function. If I, if I made the approximating rectangle vertical, um, it would be more of a pain because I'd have to use the plus square root on one side. I'd have to use the minus square root on the other. Um, so here, like dA, it's the, you know, the width times dy, because it's a horizontal one, and the width here is the right minus the left, which in this case is minus y squared minus parentheses y minus 2, which is actually, of course, 2 minus y minus y squared dy. I, I like to always try to clean things up before I end up integrating, you know? I think that's about as clean as I can get. Um, but the question still remains for what y, right? Like I said at the beginning, we need to find these intersection points. How do we do that? Oh, <laughs> sorry to those at home. Yeah, it's not too late though. It's not too late. There it is. Every so often I end class and never pivot over. It's like, no. This one there. There it is though. So to find the intersection points, I need to set the left x equal to the right x, right? That's where they're both true. Those are the points of intersection. And so for this, that's minus. Uh, well, y minus 2 equal to minus y squared, right? Which gives me y squared plus y minus 2 equals to 0. And this is a book problem, so it's going to factor nicely. <laughs> you know, uh, y, y, how does it factor?
plus 2 and minus 1. That sounds right to me. So that means the points of intersection are at minus 2 and 1, right? Which means that, you know, minus 2, 1, right? In other words, this is for minus 1 less than, excuse me, 1, yeah, I'm an idiot, minus 2 less than or equal to y less than or equal to 1. You have to answer that question in order to set up the integral, right? For which, for which choices of y is my picture an adequate representation of the situation? Well, between minus 2 and 1, we have this horizontal strip which approximates the infinitesimal area of this little thing. And then to find the whole area of the shaded region, you know, I just, uh, I integrate. I take the continuous sum as it's known. So A, the integral of dA, which in, you know, specifically here is the integral of, I mean, when I write integral of dA, dA like that, that's an invitation for working, for, for understanding the setup that I've drawn over here. It's just a, a guide, a mnemonic, if you will. Um, so minus 2 to 1 of 2 minus y minus y squared dy. All right. And now I integrate. What's the integral of 2 minus y minus y squared? It's a uh, 2y minus 1 half y squared minus 1 third y cubed. FTC2 says I have to evaluate that from minus 2 to 1, right? And now we've got some arithmetic we need to be careful, right? So we've got 2 times 1, which is 2, minus a half times 1 squared, which is 1 minus a third times one cubed, which is one. So that's what I get from the upper bound. And then I have to subtract, parentheses are your friend here, two times minus two minus one half times four minus one third times minus eight. Notice that minus two cubed is minus eight. I'll, I'll write down one more step here before I... Now, um, half minus a third is, is actually minus uh, five six. So I've got like two minus five six. I mean, you could, you could fall back on a calculator here at this point, you know? But um, I've got minus four, minus two, plus eight thirds. Uh, fine, I'll do a little bit more. Maybe I can do this without a calculator. I don't know, two minus five six. Um, plus 6 minus 8 thirds. Multiply that by 2 over 2 to make it into sixths. So I've got minus 16. So it looks like I've got 8 minus um, 5 plus 16 is 21 over 6. Ooh, that factors. 21 is 3 times 7. So that's 8 minus 7 over 2, which is, you know, 16 over 2 minus 7 over 2, which is 9 halves, I think. Was this an odd problem? Hey, it was an odd problem. 12.2, number 3. Let's see if I got the answer in the back of the book. Moment of truth. What do you think? Did I do it? Did I get it? Did I make arithmetic mistake? What are your feelings? Yep, nine halves. So either I'm right and the books, either we're both wrong or the book and me is right. So anyway, there it is. So to calculate the area bounded by curves, there's, you know, um, I think there's three major parts to it. The one part is to get a, a sort of um, a big picture of what the graph is, right, to sketch the graph. And then the next step is to add, to decide um, how you want to divide the graph up to find the area to write your infinitesimal rectangles, right? And in that, 
in that step, then you, of course, you want to add detail to the graph. You need to figure out what range, in this case, of y values the, the picture makes sense for, which we figured out was from minus 2 to 1, right? Once you do that, then you integrate dA over the range of values, which makes sense. So. So you can do another if you like. Any, I mean, you can ask questions about this one if you want. We got time. So just to remind you guys what's going, coming up, we have the test three like right before the Thanksgiving break, and that's, what is that? That's like next Thursday, is it? Yeah, so the 18th. Um, and uh, if you look at the course planner, I mean, we've covered all the topics. So we're, you know, I'm just working more examples of the same at this point, right? So we definitely... Yeah, any, any questions you have, like, we can even start reviewing for the final, if you guys want um, to go back to earlier stuff, we can do that. But, I, you know, I think we should try to finish test three material first, right? So you guys got, and so it, it would be wise for you to take some time to try to work the homeworks that remain, right? There's missions eight, nine, and ten. So if I were you, I would take some time, work those problems, see where you get stuck, and then you can bring your questions to class and we can answer them because we have time. You know, but you've got to have the questions before I can answer them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let me work more of these. Uh, let's see here. It's the return of the the hull the hull monster. Oh, that's right. <laughs> this door. <laughs> Most doors, if you, they, they swing shut on their own. This one has this, like, proclivity to stay open there. Um, okay, so how about this one? Let's look at uh, y equals to, oh, I don't know, 4 minus x squared and y equals to the, um, Uh, f's value of x uh, minus 1, let's say. I'll make it 2. That might make it prettier. Um, no, that makes it too pretty. Uh, well, fine, let's just take that to find the area bounded. Now, hopefully my question makes sense, <laughs> okay? Right. Now, there is an easier way to give you this kind of question on a test, right? If I want to make it like, not take as much time, what do I do? It's simple. I provide you a graph of the, of the functions involved, and then I say find the area. If you already have the graph, that takes away a third of the problem, you know? Um, so I, I don't... Right, so that's, you know, that's one of the things you want to, you know, um, gain a mastery of as a calculus student is like how to graph these basic functions. Um, and we do try to, I mean, we do try to teach that stuff in pre-calculus, but I don't think most students master it, unfortunately. I mean, I certainly didn't. I was learning how to graph things all through the calculus sequence myself as a student, for sure, you know. Um, I think I was learning things about pre-calculus topics well into my teaching. I don't think anybody really absorbs everything in pre-calculus, like there's always stuff to learn. You know, the question is, do you have some kind of method you can fall back on if you get stumped? For graphing, you can always like pick 10 points and just connect the dots, right? If you choose wisely, you can connect. If you just crunch the numbers and make a table of x and y, you can always kind of recreate the graph from picking a bunch of points. That takes time, you know, so if you're stuck on everything, that's a problem. But um, Obviously, if you actually just know, okay, that's 4 minus x squared, right? So that's got a y-intercept of 4. And by the way, y equals to 4 minus x squared. 
that's um, minus x squared minus 4, right? Which is also minus x minus 2 times x plus 2, right? So I actually know that that has, you know, x-intercepts of 2 and minus 2. And it's a parabola that opens down. So it's roughly speaking like that. You know, this is, this is that one. Now, how about absolute value of x minus 2? Well, to graph that, I know what the absolute value function looks like, right? You guys know what the absolute value function looks like? It's like a v, right? So if y equals absolute value of x is what? It is just the v that opens up from the origin. And so, oh, I hope I, let me pivot back in case I missed. I think I had all of that in frame, but just to pause there for a second for the folks at home in case I was missing something. I don't think I was, but here we go. So, um, so I actually think about, here's like my internal logic for graphing the absolute value of x. I think, aha, well, absolute value of x is like this, right? And then if I, if I subtract 2, that just shifts it down to, right? So absolute value of x is just, it has y-intercept minus 2, right, which you could figure out from just plugging in 0 into the formula, right? And it's aligned with slope 1, like that, and slope minus 1, like that. Now, it just so happens, yeah, I, I have drawn it in that way. I guess you could, if you were not careful in your graph, you might not have seen that the intersection, intersection points are actually the what? They, they actually intersect at the x-axis. And it happens to intersect at the x-axis, right? Um, so at some point, you know, I always debate whether or not to do the intersection points before I set up the, um, the, 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 the rectangle or after. I'll do it before this time. So we're looking for four, where, where does 4 minus x squared, right, equal to the absolute value of x minus 2. That's where they meet, right? Where the, the graphs intersect where both equations are true. So I can put y equal to y to find the intersection points here. Um, so, yeah, that gives me, um, what does that give me? That gives me 6 minus x squared equals the absolute value of x, which I can square, square that. That gives me 36 minus 12x squared plus x to the fourth equals to x squared. Gowsers. Um, which, which gives me x to the fourth, goodness gracious, uh, minus 13x squared uh, plus 36 equal to zero. Huh, cool. So that is x squared minus four times x squared minus nine, I think. Uh, to get rid of the absolute value. Now, if you didn't want to do that, of course, you could just solve it for plus or minus x, you know. I mean, there are two different paths to go down here, right? The one is to square the equation like I did, which will give you, you know, So x is equal to plus or minus 2, or x is equal to plus or minus 3, right? Man, I feel like I've made a mistake somewhere, but I don't know where it is. I 
No, I guess I haven't. The thing is just interpretation, right? So I've got four answers. Why do I got four answers? Let me kind of explain it to you. What, what's happened when we, um, you know, when we square the equation is we end up essentially finding these other points down here, which are not actually the points we're after, right? So there, there are two extraneous solutions. These are, these are extraneous. They're, they're not actually the relevant solutions. They're solutions that we have added to the problem by squaring the, whenever you square an equation, you can enlarge the, super, the, the solution set. When we squared the equation, we ended up adjoining the three and minus three solutions, which like geometrically come from if you put y equals to minus x, then you kind of just extend over to here where it doesn't actually apply for the absolute value function, you get this other intersection point. So if you look at y equals minus x, you get the intersection points of three and minus two. If you look at y equals to x, you actually get the intersection points of minus three and two, right? So remember that the absolute value function is equal to x for positive x is equal to minus x for negative x. So whenever we're like doing algebra with the absolute value function, we may face um, like adjoining solutions from both the plus and minus x equal to y function. Because they're not relevant. They're, they're these points of intersection. They're this, and so that's not, they're, they're, they're not actually the solutions that we're looking for. I mean, we already actually anticipated the actual solution, actual is two and minus two here, right? I mean, and you can check you can check that 2 and minus 2 are actually points of intersection by plugging into 4 minus 2 squared, 0. Absolute value of plus or minus 2, minus 2 is 2 minus 2 is 0. So like plugging in 2 or minus 2 gets you y equals to 0 for both of these. So those are points of intersection. Um, so what's the other way you could have done the algebra here? If you don't like my squaring it, you could do it like this. You've, you've got 6 minus x squared equal to absolute value of x, right? So this, so if x is greater than 0, you've got to solve 6 minus x squared equals to x, right? Which is x squared plus x minus 6, which is x plus 3 times x minus 2 equal to 0. So x equals minus 3 or x equals to 2. Of course, x is positive, so that's the only actual solution. There is an extraneous solution. Geometrically, what's going on is we're finding the, this 2 and that minus 3. See, because we're solving 6 minus x squared equals to x, we've ignored the fact that like, it's absolute value of x. And some, I mean, I've, I'm not ignoring it because I wrote x greater than 0 off to the side. And then the other equation x less than 0, we'd have 6 minus x squared equals to minus x, right? Because the absolute value of x is x, x greater than 0, minus x for x less than 0, right? So solve this, you've got x squared uh, minus x minus 6 equal to 0, which is x minus 3x plus 2. So the plus and the minus is flip-flopped which gives us solutions of 3 and minus 2. Only one of those is subject to the condition x less than 0. So this is the honest-to-goodness solution, and that one's extraneous. Which is easier, squaring it or solving two separate quadratics? Probably solving two separate quadratics is easier, because a lot of you guys are going to get hung up on, like, this quartic, right? Like, this might have stopped you in your tracks, factoring the quartic, right? Would this have stopped you? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, right? But anyway, or maybe, you know, and, and do you need to factor all this? Do you need to do all this? I would argue no. If you've graphed carefully, you might have seen from the outset that, of course, we're going from 2 to minus 2, right? OK. So I'm just verifying for sure that those are the points of intersection that we haven't deceived ourselves with like a wishful graph. 
that's really not an issue for this problem, but there are other ones that are. Um, okay, so should we make a horizontal or a vertical approximating strip for this one? If I made horizontal, right, here and here it would be different. See, because the F value equation is governing the left and the right side of this one, but the parabola equation is governing the left and right side of that one, right? In contrast, if I choose vertical boxes to set up the area calculation, well, it's, it's nicer because everywhere here, there's a top you know, this, the y top. So the thickness, of course, for a vertical strip is dx. So dA here is y top minus y base dx. What's the top y? Well, the top y is 4 minus x squared. And the bottom is absolute value of x minus 2, right? I can, now be awful careful. Let me erase, let me, I'm, I'm going to erase all my intersection point calculations, okay? Because we need room to integrate here. And so you tell me, take a look at what I've just written there. Right? Take a look what I've just written there. And you tell me why it's wrong. Why is the last thing I wrote here incorrect? I mean, one way I can make it correct is by adding parentheses. See, because I need to be careful, that minus has to distribute to the minus 2, right? So when there's a minus 2 in the formula for the bottom y, and I do minus the bottom y, that has to become a plus 2 when I distribute the sign. So this is 4 minus x squared minus the absolute value of x plus 2. Now this is 6 minus x squared minus the absolute value of x dx. Now, um, and this is for what range of x? This is for minus 2, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2, right? So let's do it. Calculate the area. integral of dA, which in this context is the integral from minus 2 to 2 of parentheses 6 minus x squared minus the absolute value of x dx. Tell me, what do you think? This integrand, is it even? Is it odd? Can you tell me anything about the thing we're integrating? Because we're integrating about a symmetric integral of the origin, which means we can use that even odd trick stuff I talked to you about the other day, right? Check it out. Like, this is an even function, right? If I replace, you know, x with minus x, the absolute value of minus x squared is still x squared because the minus gets squared. And the absolute, the absolute value, excuse me, I said absolute value. I mean, just if we take parentheses minus x and square it, it gives us back x squared. So, like, this term is even. If I put that minus x into it, it returns the same.
And the absolute value of minus x, of course, is equal to absolute value of x again. Absolute value eats minuses, right? This is an even function. So we can use the, the doubling trick that I talked to you guys about the other day. Or, of course, what's the other way you could look at this? By the symmetry of the area, this is the same as what? Twice the integral from 0 to 2 of 6 minus x squared minus the absolute value of x dx. Now, if x is positive, right, x is non-negative, so notice this, x is greater than or equal to 0 for 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2, right? So the absolute value of x is equal to x. So we can trade the integral we have for an easier one to think about, 2 times the integral from 0 to 2 of 6 minus x squared minus x. Right? Because we're always just in the, the positive case of the absolute value function, right? And then we integrate, which is what? Um, 2 times, well, I got 6x minus 1 third x cubed minus 1 half x squared. Evaluate from 0 to 2. This is by FTC2, right? Now, what, what do we have here? Well, we've got 2 times, well, 6 times 2 is 12. Um, 2 cubed is 8, so minus 8 thirds. 2 squared is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2, so I get minus 2. And that's it, because when I plug in 0, I don't get anything from that expression, right? That antiderivative evaluates to 0 at 0. So that's... Um, 2 times 10 minus 8 thirds. Well, 10 is 30 thirds, so um, 30 minus 8 is 22 thirds. So I've got 2 times 22 over 3. So I believe we get 44 over 3. If I haven't made some silly arithmetic mistake. Any, uh, any questions? So these problems are nothing to be scared of. If you have your basic integration down and you make your graph carefully, it's something you guys can do, right? Um, I'm going to show you a secret formula. I don't show all calculus ones this formula. But since I like you guys, I'm going to show it to you. All right. Are you excited? You actually are. Okay. So this is, I don't, I don't think I've really seen this in calculus books that I can think of. But um, check this out. So. Let's consider the absolute value of x. So this is what? This is x. Or, or I say it's minus x for x less than 0, right? And it's x for x greater than or equal to 0, right? So what if we integrate both cases? So I call this thing f of x, right? So the integral of f of x, well, the integral of the absolute value of x dx, if I do case-wise integration, right, I've got like minus 1 half x squared, right, so plus some constant, let's say c1, and 1 half x squared plus some constant c2, right?
So check this out. This we can rewrite as minus, uh, well, just one half x times the absolute value of x plus c1 and one half x times the absolute value of x plus c2. And um, if we want to make our antiderivative continuous, right, if we want to have a continuous antiderivative, and I think I do, continuity, continuity at x equals to zero implies I should pick c1 equal to c2, right? So in other words, this I can write as the integral of the absolute value of x dx is actually just equal to one half x absolute value of x plus a constant. Now you might say, I don't know, okay, great. Well, um, so I, <laughs> I would point out to you, so previously, if I had, say, the integral from minus 3 to 2 of the absolute value of x dx, how would we have done that? I would have previously told you, well, you've got to go minus 3 to 0 of absolute value of x dx plus the integral from 0 to 2 of the absolute value of x dx, right? And then that's minus the integral of x dx from, from minus 3 to 0 and plus the integral from 0 to 2 of x dx because the formula for absolute value is minus over here and plus over here and, and so you get like, you know, minus 1 half x squared evaluated from uh, minus 3 to 0, 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to 2, which of course is minus 1 half of 0 squared plus 1 half of minus 3 squared plus 1 half uh, 2 squared minus 1 half of 0 squared which apparently is 9 halves minus 4 halves, also known as 5 halves, which is kind of a pain, right? Let's take my new formula out for a spin. Integral from minus 3 to 2 of absolute value of x dx. Well, this is the antiderivative, so 1 half x absolute value of x evaluated from minus 3 to 2, 1 half of 2 times absolute value of 2, minus 1 half of minus 3 times absolute value of minus 3. In other words, 4 halves um, plus, huh, I must have made a miscalculation in my previous thing, 9 halves. Oh no, I got 3 minuses, so it's minus, isn't it? Wait a minute. I have done something askew. Oh, how did I how did I get a minus four halves up here? Should it have been? No, it shouldn't have been. I should have had thirteen over two in the previous one as well. Did you see my error? the error was right going from here down to there. See, I changed this plus to a minus, which was bogus. Should have been plus. And so this should have been 13 over 2. But obviously, this is easier, right? So the plus 4 is the answer. It is, it is nine, 9 halves plus 4 halves, which is 13 halves. But see, with this formula, I don't have to break up into cases. Which is nice, because breaking up into cases is a pain. So if you know about this formula, you can cut through my absolute value problems like a knife through butter. Hot knife, hot knife. But anyway. Any questions?
questions? The absolute value? Um, well, I mean, suitably adjusted. I think if I had, I mean, we can we can try another example. That's not just straight absolute value. Like if we had, let's see here. Try something like, suppose you wanted to integrate from 0 to 1 of the absolute value of 2x <coughs> minus 1 dx. See that, if we were to do without my formula, we'd have to break up into cases, because 1 half is where that's 0. So the graph of this. You know, it's something like, um, when we plug in 0, it's at 1, right? When you plug in 2, it's at, excuse me, you plug in 1, it's at 1. And when you plug in a half, it's at 0. So this is like one of these graphs. So, um, I mean, I actually can tell you the answer already, because those are triangles, and I can use 1 half base times height to tell you the integral. Which is kind of anticlimactic, but okay. So, well, the thing is, I have this formula for, you know, so setting aside the fact that I just see an obvious non calculus based way to calculate the area here, all right, set that aside. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to show, showcase this formula, um, absolute value of x dx is equal one half x absolute value of x plus a constant, all right. Okay, so I would make a u substitution. So I'd let u equal 2x minus 1. So du is 2x, uh, excuse me, 2dx, right? So dx is 1 half du. And I also have to change the bounds, so u of 0 is 2 times 0 minus 1, right? u of 0 is minus 1. u of 1 is 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1. So we go from minus 1 to 1 in the u variable. Absolute value of u times du over 2. So after I make a u substitution, then I can use my formula. But in terms of u. See, so this is, did I? Move the camera? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, I have the worst memory. Let's see here. So that's 1 half. And the integral of absolute value of u is u times the absolute value of u, right? According to my. And oh, but I've got an extra half. I got the half from here, and I got the half from the integral. So I should have a quarter there, right? And from minus 1 to 1, so I've got 1 quarter times 1 times the absolute value of 1 minus 1 quarter of minus 1 times the absolute value of minus 1. So in other words, I got a quarter plus a quarter. I got a half. So that, that's, a, that's how this formula could be used for other absolute value problems, which just aren't straight absolute value of x. You can make a 